Excited to be here today. This topic is so dear to my heart. When I first became a leader, a people manager, I was very young, and I, the idea of conflict, disagreement, was anxiety provoking for me. Now, as facilitators, leaders, we're managing relational dynamics all the time, right? So the invitation that I want to make to you today is think about relational breakdowns like miscommunications, differences as a doorway, as a doorway to get to know ourselves better, as a doorway to get to know each other better, and as a doorway for more compassion and benevolence towards ourselves and each other. So relational breakdowns are a part of every day, right? But how do they start? It starts within us. It starts with a voice. Sometimes it's projecting into the future and saying, ooh, are you sure you want to do that? Sometimes it's advice. It sounds like my mom. And sometimes it's trying to be helpful. Hey. If you just put this person's needs first, they're gonna show up for you later. And guess what that does to my relationships? I would do things for people when they didn't even ask, and then they don't show up for me when I need them, and I resent them, and guess what? I lose a friend, I lose a colleague that I actually wanna be in relationship with. So this inner voice is coming up with strategies on how to get me what I want, but a lot of times it doesn't work out. Today we're gonna to call this inner voice our inner narrator. Studies show that about a quarter to a half of our waking lives, we're talking to ourselves like this. When we're not aware of them, they take over. So I'm, gonna, I'm about to show you a clip from one of my favorite comedians. It's called The Perfectionist and the Call. You know, I was gonna tell you yesterday after I, oh sure, no problem. How did that feel? Okay. Except for the ending. Well, you know how we like to end a call. Casual, affectionate, affectionate and cool. cool. I know. The call's behind us. Now what's our course of action? Do over. Bingo. Okay. Let's stick that landing. Let's stick the landing. Hey, it's me. I yeah. was just wondering if I could say goodbye again. Stick the landing. It was really great talking to you and catch you later. Bye. How did that feel? I don't know. Hmm. It was casual, but... Not very cool. Should I apologize? I think that's your only recourse. Okay. <laughs> Stick the landing. Hey, I just want to apologize. Casual affection. What? Casual no, affection. No, I, I just mean Give me the phone. That. Give me the phone. Hi, listen. <laughs> what we need to do is put... What happened? She hung up. Oh, no. This is hard. What do we do? Delete her from your phone. So, I said relational breakdown start within us, right? This is how the inner narrator works. We're just going about our lives, having a meeting, talking about a project, having a good time, calling my friend. She didn't pick up. And then the inner narrator starts developing a story. She never picks up. She doesn't care about you. And then the story sometimes contains what I call a distorted threat. For me, someone not caring about me brings up my eight-year-old inner narrator. You guys are getting to know me really well today. Growing up, my mom was really busy, not available a lot. I have this memory of stomping on my bed, trying to get her to come, and she just can't come because she's busy. And at about eight years old, I developed this strategy. I have this inner narrator coming online, and this inner narrator is like, just be helpful, and she'll pay attention. So this friend, I'm helping her a lot, but she's not picking up. She doesn't show up on time, right? So I start to be like, she doesn't care about you. So now I have a distorted threat 
that says this person is not available. And when I was eight and I didn't have much resources, that was a threat. When we let our inner narrators perceive threats, they might be greater than what that threat really is to us today as grown-ups. Because when the inner narrators were, were first formed, they weren't as resourced. The fact that mom wasn't there for me used to be uh, a huge threat. But as a 40-year-old friend not calling me back, not that big of a threat. What happens though is if I don't check that, I get activated, okay? And so I'm gonna give you an example and I kinda need your help. I want you to get involved in this one. So I'm in a session with my client, Tom, and he's brought a really anxiety provoking situation to my attention and we're working through this. Okay, I'm gonna give you a snippet of that conversation. So I want you to help me figure out what those potential threats are in his story, all right? Because this is an important concept. I wanna make sure you really get it. So it's causing him a lot of anxiety. I'm just gonna give you a minute to take it in. What's the potential threat in his story? Anybody have a guess? Is it the perception of performance at his job? Yeah. Yeah. He's perceiving a threat to his job, the way he makes a living. Yeah, That's, that could be a big threat, right? Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, failure. Lots of talk about failure here. It sounds like he's perceiving that she's doing it to him. Oh purposefully. So there's an, a malintent in the story. And he, he's not in control of it. Oh, we're not in control. That's really hard for some people, right? Yeah. Anything else? Mm-hmm. Say again? He does not feel heard. I'm going to come back to that. You just nailed a big one there. He does not feel heard. I love talking to facilitators. <laughs> you just went way here. You got us to the bottom of it. All right, lots of threats, right? Now we call it a potential threat because we don't know, right? This is really uh, personal to Tom. Um, we work through that, right? But when we perceive that there is a threat, our nervous systems get activated. There are two pathways running up and down our bodies who's responsible for a timely reaction to threats. And it's not just neurological, it's not just cognitive, it is physiological. Because in the olden days, our timely reaction to a threat meant life or death. Our hunting and gathering environments have changed a lot but our nervous system functions about the same. Now, the perceived threat, how we perceive it, is very different depending on our lived experiences. Me and you could be in the same meeting, the same sequence of events are happening. I am activated. I'm about to fly. Actually, my default is fawn. That makes me a really good consultant, really good <laughs> listener, but it gets me in trouble. So. I am activated and I'm about to respond to whatever this inner narrator is saying, and you're not, right? Like you're calm, nothing's happening, we're just having a meeting. So this reaction is very personal depending on how we grew up and what the messages were, how our needs were met or not met. So relational attunement is about being in relationship with these inner narrators, not in a way that like pushes them away or shutting them up. We have to be in compassionate relationship with our inner narrators if we wanna be in compassionate relationship with ourselves and with other people. And so relational attunement is about getting to know these parts of us and how they behave and what they want for us so that compassion is accessible, so we can be attuned with ourselves and others. 
And when we can do this, we're more like these birds. These birds migrate from one side of the world to another. This beautiful motion is created simply with one bird saying, I need food right now. She goes down to get food and another responds. And it's with this responsiveness that they're able to go from one side of the world to the other without a plan, without a leader, without any strategies, and keeping each other safe while they do that. Imagine what's possible if we can be more like this, if work can be more like this. And it comes down to every single one of us doing this work, being attuned, being attuned with ourselves and others. But we can't do that. We can't travel with a common purpose because we disconnect from that purpose when our inner narrators are online because we get drawn to address their concerns. We disconnect from the group. Sometimes we disconnect from ourselves. Now, here's a really important thing to remember. We all have inner narrators. It's part of our survival mechanism, okay? And they all have good intentions. The most important thing is to remember they want something good for me and I want to know what that is and I want to move, move toward that good thing. Right? Some of my inner narrators just want me to belong because I had experiences moving to this country where I didn't feel like I belonged. It's really important to me that I feel belonging. And when I work with clients, I get them through this exercise where they check in on which needs are being threatened. We're not gonna go into that today. I'm not gonna have you do this in public with a bunch of strangers. The thing I want you to remember is no matter what those needs are, all of us, are stumbling toward wanting to be seen, to be heard, and to be loved. Even the bully, even Tom's colleague, who he thinks is going around him and threatening his job, even her, just finding her way back to love and connection. So here's some common inner narrators that I think most people are kind of familiar with, right? Yeah, maybe a little bit. Okay, not just me. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm not just up here talking about my voices. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, I want to get you guys working with me on this. Uh, let's start with an uh, easy one. Um, I think the perfectionists we're all familiar with. Um, so what's the perfectionist's good intention? What's the perfectionist want for us? Anybody? Yeah. A job well done. Do a good job. Yeah. Go ahead. Your reputation. reputation. Yeah. Look good. Right. That can be really important at work. If you want a promotion, if you want to be seen as a leader, good intention. What about the, uh, oh, here's a harder one, Cat catastrophizer. Never be surprised. Yeah. I don't want you to be disappointed. I'm going to make sure you know what the worst thing that could happen is, right? Yeah, Hira. Yes, protect us. Protection is a really big job for these guys. This whole cast is all about protection, actually. Uh, let's do one more. Uh, what about the pleaser? Oh, man, this one I know really well, so I can talk about this one all day. But what about you guys? What do you think the pleaser wants for us? Yes. Harmony. Harmony. Support. support. Yes, connection, harmony, support. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, and just remember, I may have an inner voice that's a pleaser, this other person might have one, but they could be fairly different flavors because remember they were developed and grew up in a way trying to get our unique needs met, right? So they might sound a little different, but here's typically what they want for us. Really good intentions. All right, so now I'm gonna have some volunteers come up and help me act out some relational dynamics. And don't worry, I have a script for you. You don't have to make up anything on this spot. This is not improv. I know improv scares a lot of people. Do I have two volunteers? So as we're getting set up, it's two people in a meeting 
talking about an advertising campaign idea. Here's your script. Person one, who wants to be person one? Uh, person one shares an idea and person two is reacting. And we'll do the, do the same meeting twice, okay? And I don't expect you to be actors. So, but you are? Okay, I'm like, well, lucky me. Uh, but try to kind of like take in that, what they're saying and the, the, the feelings and get into it okay. as, as well as you could. And uh, just so you know, per, who's person one? Me. You're person one. So you're, um, I just want to have their inner narrators kind of just hold it uh, so they know which one you are. And here's your inner narrator. So this one is the perfectionist. They're not talking. The people are talking in a meeting, all right? They're just hanging around. Okay, go ahead. We could buy billboard ads all over the country and advertise the digital fluency program. That's really expensive. Okay, well, how about radio ad spots? Those should be cheaper. Do people listen to the radio these days? Well, where do you think people spend time? I don't know, maybe online? Hmm, we could buy online ads. Ads can get expensive. They don't always work in my experience. Why don't we think of ideas that are more cost effective? Okay. Hmm. Mm. All right, so people are laughing. What did you notice? What was person one doing? Speak up, speak up. Go ahead. Yeah, ple yeah, appeasing, trying to go with it, flowing with it, okay? Anybody else? Yeah, it's trying to break through, trying so hard. Person one is trying so hard, okay? So I am going to have you do this again. Thank you. But now your inner narrators are offline, so I'll take those from you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your service, Pixie and Puff. Um, so now they're offline, and watch what happens. We could buy billboard ads all over the country and advertise the digital fluency program. That can get really expensive really quick. The fact that that's the first thing that jumped out at you makes me think that's an important constraint but it hasn't come up yet. Can you say more about that? Well, we spent so much on the last campaign and got no results. I see, that's helpful history. What happened? Honestly, we had these consultants working on it and I just assumed they knew what they were doing, so I approved the campaign, but I should have asked for more data before signing off on it. I'm coming into this a little more cautious. I just don't want to make the same mistake again. That makes sense. Can you think of other experiences or constraints we should consider before we get back to the brainstorming? Yeah, but I'm not the only one who has perspective on this, I think. Maybe we should get the team together and come up with a list of constraints. That's a great, it really is a great idea. That's a great <laughs> idea. Um, <laughs> sorry, breaking the fourth wall, as it called, yeah. Um, that's a great idea. I'd like your help to come up with a list of people. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'd like your help to come up with a list of people that have the right background and experiences. Could you help me with that? Of course. <laughs> oh, thank you. Give them a big round of applause. Thank you so much. The acting was wonderful, first rate. Thank you so much. I'm gonna have you. Okay, hopefully these don't roll off. Um, wonderful, so what's the difference? What did you notice? Oh yeah, the second one, when the inner narrator was not online, not activated, she was being really curious. Yeah, and asked very good questions. Go ahead. She was, she was validating her concerns. And she didn't get activated because she felt heard. She felt heard. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Yeah. She was engaged in the problem at hand. She was not off solving something else, another need that she has to be liked, perhaps, right? When we don't have our inner narrators activated, what happens is we can stay engaged 
with the conversation and what's available to us is benevolent curiosity. We're genuinely interested in what the other person has to say. We're saying back to them, and they feel like we care. If Tom's coworker were to talk to him like this, Tom would feel like she really cares, even if we didn't solve the problem in that meeting, right? They have a path to the solution. When the pleaser was offline and she was genuinely engaged in the dialogue, the other person sends safety here. So now I can really say what I think. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Great observations. All right, so now I'm gonna have you guys try to really embody this, what we're talking about. Okay, so I'm gonna play two games. Uh, the first game, really easy. You just have to be yourself. No stuffed animals, no stuffed animals. They're done. So we're gonna try to get into groups of three. And when you get into your group, just pick a letter, A, B, or C. Doesn't matter, just pick a letter, okay? And this is the game. Douglas sent an email out yesterday that we're all kind of engaged in this next two days on this challenge with the ACC Digital Literacy Program, right? So we're gonna use that as just fodder for this exercise, okay? So the ACC Digital Fluency Program is just basically, in case you didn't watch the video, of course you all did. Right? You all know what this is about, you researched it, you know, but just in case. Um, there's one person, you know. Uh, it's, it's a program that teaches military spouses computer literacy skills, like, you know, Word, Excel, things like that. And uh, it's, it's working really well here, I think, locally, right, Douglas? It's working really well, and uh, because it's online, anybody can do it. You don't have to be in Austin, and so they want more awareness. Okay, all over the country, all right? Um, and so, so we're gonna get ourselves engaged in this problem, in this challenge, okay? So what I want you all to do when you get into your groups of three is person A is going to come up with a campaign idea. Just think about a campaign idea, any idea. Doesn't have to be good, okay, any idea. The exercise is not about the idea, okay? It's just about the conversation. You're gonna socialize it with person B. And person B just has to ask supportive questions to tease the idea out. Don't add your ideas, right? Basically just be yourselves, be the good facilitators that you are, okay? And we're gonna go back and forth for about five minutes. Person C, observing, taking notes. And I just want you to notice what happens when the person's not activated. What does that space feel like, okay? Clear, any questions? All right, go ahead, get into groups of three. All right, so let's bring, bring you back. Uh, what are you present to? Lots of laughter. What are you present to? What, what are you noticing? Ooh. Real oh my goodness. Are you gonna give this talk the rest of the, okay. <laughs> Authenticity, poten real potential. We did that in five minutes? Yeah. Shit, I did my job, I'm going home. Oh my goodness, anybody else? Anybody? Don't be intimidated by that. <laughs> yes, Hira. Mmm, it was intentional. You felt flow. Oh my god. You guys are good. What else? <laughs> Go ahead. And I would say that's a little bit of a voice, right? That kind of was like, oh, make sure your idea is good. But then you had a moment of, no, this is safe. So that is the power when we feel safe when we know that the other people are trying so much as possible in five minutes when we're calm and regulated and we have a supportive partner. Yeah, I'm about to cry. Okay, <laughs> so 
So let's move on and play another game. And now, this time, our inner narrator is going to be activated. And I want you to play into that, OK? So this time, we are doing a little improv, OK? Same groups. Change your letters. Pick a different letter. So we're going to rotate. Person B is going to open this envelope. And you need to share. There's one for each table. So um, there's, there's enough. And there's cards in there. Um, and there's cards in there. And I'll tell you what you're going to do in a minute. But I'm going to have, I'm going to need a volunteer again, just one volunteer. And I'm going to need Mike C. I'm going to have a volunteer come up and actually help me demo this game. OK? Go ahead. Thank you. Not afraid of improv. Yes! <laughs> I thought I'd have a few. So this is your envelope, and you're going to randomly pick a card. So I'm going to put the um, instructions up. I'm just going to walk through this, and then we're going to act it out. So game two, inner narrators fully activated for person B. Person A, his job is to come up with a totally ridiculous, unworkable idea. I'm really good at that, so I'll show you how that works in a minute. Totally unworkable. But I want you to love it. Like, really love it. Please don't let it go. Do not let it go. Love it so much. And person B's job is to take a card. Go ahead and take a card out. And on the card, there is these orange letters uh, on the bottom, if you're colorblind, it's on the bottom, that says automatic reaction. And your job as person B is to stick to that automatic reaction. Do your best job that you can. You cannot be too exaggerated. There's no such thing today. Exaggeration is welcomed, person B. OK? So person C, same. Observe. Here are some prompts for you to observe with. Notice what happens. All right, so we're going to do that right now. You're B. So I'm doing. I'm A. I'm doing the automatic reaction. I'm going to come up with the ridiculous, unworkable idea that I freaking love. Okay. All right. All right. Here we go. So, and I actually don't have the idea yet, so I'm thinking about it. You know how, like, so military spouses, right? They have kids, probably families. You know how? You know how, like. There's these animal zoos, petting zoos. They take around to markets and uh -huh. stuff with rabbits yeah. and yeah. hedgehogs and things. What I think we should do is, on the same day, get like a million of these zoos, OK? And we're going to send them to all the military families, like around dinner time. So the kids can be playing with the animals, like petting, you know, stuff like that. And then, you know, then we can talk, you know, like, <laughs> like Tupperware parties from like the 70s, you know, like now we can talk to the, 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 the parents about this digital fluency program. And they're going to be like so excited because, you know, everybody's doing Instagram, Facebook, like, that's just like nobody's going to notice, right? So animal zoos, I think it's, that's it. That's it. Okay. All right. So the first thing we need to do then is just start mapping out all of the communities where we're going to do this and start calling those petting zoos, right? So we can make a spreadsheet. So you can start with a spreadsheet that's going to get all of these petting zoos together. And then um, I think what we'll do is we'll have Brenda um, look at where we can get donations for hand sanitizer so that all the parents will be willing to have this stuff come in. Um, so she can do that. She'll, she'll start getting all the donations for the hand sanitizer to come in. And then we probably also but, but need a can sponsor. Can we just talk more about the idea, though? Like, I just want to flesh that out some more. Well, it's, I a think good, it's, it's a good like idea. So idea. Like, we got to get these tasks oriented, because there's a lot to coordinate here, right? We have to figure out, all right, in which city, I, what routes we're going to well, have these I, folks I just, go on. I just don't want Brenda to be concerned you know, about the cost, because I want to make sure like this idea is really awesome and yes. she really gets how it's going to work. Right, but we want it to happen, right? So we need to get people assigned to the various things. Like who's going to look at like what the traffic patterns know. are like so that the animals aren't in their vans longer than they should be, <sighs> right? Oh my god. And right, we I need mean, we need it... to make sure that that this is happening cuz we want the idea to happen, Why right? Why are you always <laughs> such a damper? Like I just like I just want to talk about how awesome the rabbits are and stuff. Like they're so freaking <laughs> cute and like okay you get it you're getting it okay 
Good stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you, Solomon. Thank you so much. Awesome. That was so good. So it's not hard. If I can do it, anybody can. So get into your groups of three, A, B, C, all right? And B, randomly pick a card. And I'll give you guys five minutes. All right, go ahead and wrap it up. Okay, so what's coming up for you guys? There was a lot of laughing, I noticed. What else is going on? Did you feel any physical sensations? Yeah, at the end I said I need a water break. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was the observer in our interaction. And yeah. I Oh my I god. Um are you familiar with that feeling, that voice? Constantly. Constantly. <laughs> I am the brakes. You're the brakes. Yeah, yeah. And it's no now the good thing is, you know, inner narrators like they make us really talented at things, right? Like, some of mine make me really good at certain parts of my jobs, right? And so that's why we don't want to villainize them. That's why we're having fun with them and we're getting to know them because they're not bad. They're not bad. They're so helpful. They make us so talented. Uh, but, but if we just kind of go with what they want or their concerns, we kind of wreak havoc in our lives and our relationships. Go ahead. Well, I thought it was so interesting because I kept, as the observer, I kept waiting for her to give up on her idea <laughs> because she was, she was so committed to it and, and she was such an optimist about it. <laughs> she literally said, I'm not going to give up on this idea and the warrior was like, it was just breaking the world. <laughs> and so it was just really fascinating to watch that dynamic of sort of, I guess, visionary sort of mindset of, well, I'm just going to how many of us have been in a meeting where we are observing something and we're like, when is this gonna blow up? It's any minute now, right? The funny thing is, I, t I told you to come up with a really exaggerated idea, right? But frankly, a lot of times we're sitting in a meeting and we're like, this VP is saying some really ridiculous stuff. And it just sounds like this, this ridiculous, do you know what I mean? And so that, that can spiral out really fast, right? And as facilitators, we're meeting these moments all the time. And if we are not aware that people have these inner narrators and what they're trying to accomplish and their intentions, what happens is we're just like, oh, what do I do? You know, like, and, and you feel like it's your job. So then your inner narrator comes on as the facilitator, like, what's my job? Do I shut it down or what do I do? You know, and then you read a manual that has like 100 bullet points about what you should do in this scenario or that scenario and you can't remember what they are, right? And what's nice about Knowing this, having this awareness, is you can approach the situation with calm and clarity. It seems like something's activated, and we can change the course of how things unfold just by being present to this phenomenon that is the human condition. Right? Awesome. Go ahead. So in this situation, I'm supposed to be acting, right? But then mm -hmm. when you Yeah. I eventually became a pleaser because I didn't want to give up my idea, so I sacrificed on pieces. So it's oh. like so everybody gets activated in that conversation, or it could if you're not aware of it. Absolutely. That's what happens when the person when the person's inner narrator comes on, you actually there's a, a part of you inside that's really good at tuning into that. That's why we call this attunement. And what we're tuning into is a lack of safety because they're not for you anymore. They're not in, they're not present to what we're trying to do anymore. And that disengagement feels unsafe because we're no longer working on a shared purpose. So then you get activated, whatever your default activations are, to try to save that situation. Because the thing about shared purpose is, if we don't all work together on it, 
we inherently know is not going to work. And if it doesn't work, it automatically threatens something that we're really invested in, or we need our livelihood, our reputation, whatever it might be, right? Anything else? Eric. Yeah. Yeah, so when I train people on, on this, they always ask me, what do I do? What do I, I'm going to have a little bit of that for you guys, but so they, they want to go get training on like, how do I respond with the correct question, right? And, but the most important thing, if we remember to be compassionate with the other person and they're all trying to be seen, heard, and loved, um, is to just ask that magic question. Tell me more. Amazing. Oh, you guys are so good. All right, so what do we do? What if we're activated? What if there's a breakdown? What if there's some unresolved tension with someone? Here are three simple things. This process is pretty complex. Someone might have an inner narrator that's been there for 40 years and we're working through it. It might take a few months to get into this compassionate relationship I'm talking about, but to start, there's three things we can do. Become aware of it, practice slowing down in the moment, slow down the reaction. And the third thing, much harder but doable, you guys did it today, practice benevolent curiosity. Somebody actually called that out earlier. They noticed when we're calm and safe, that's available. So here's a few things that you can explore when you're trying to get to know these parts of you. I have people draw their narrators because it, ma it makes it tangible, right? Each of these inner voices have their own unique physiological reactions. It's amazing, these physiological reactions, sometimes it's like just, it's a headache, or sometimes it's, it's energy that moves. You know, sometimes it's like a stomach tightening. So getting to know that reaction can help you know when they're automatically happening. And then if you explore a little bit what their fears are for you, what their concerns might be. They might also have automatic reactions. So when people talk about, I have this pattern, that's what it is. When I'm working with people, they know what the pattern is and they've been trying to change it for a long time. And they also are aware of what the results are of that pattern, like my helper. When people don't show up for me, I get like, I helped you so much. They don't know. They had no idea I was going my, out of my way to do all these things for them, right? So I don't do that anymore. But that used to be like 80% of my life was doing things for people and they didn't know and they didn't know I expected them to show up for me when I needed them. <sighs> it's coming back now. <laughs> I'm having an activation just thinking about it. So very important to be compassionate with yourself. Um, I'm feeling the feeling, so I'm like, ooh, <laughs> compassion. Um, and very important to know, like I said earlier, what their good intentions are. Oh, they're trying to get me to be supported and feel connection to the people in my life. What are some ways that that's where creativity and new strategies can be developed? As a four-year-old, here are my automatic reactions. But as an adult now, what's available to me? And I engage with my resources. What, what's available to me often is myself what I'm capable of, but also I can get people involved in brainstorming new strategies, right? So this is a way to get aware, okay? And just to, to be aware also of when they come online, is it, for some people, it's like a physical sensation you can feel. For other people, it's your brain starts to go and do solutions, you know, to get ahead of this problem, right? So get familiar with that sensation, whatever that is. Slow down. That's the other practice. Sounds really simple. It can be kind of hard because some of us have been reacting to these concerns for years and years and years. I was just talking to a client of mine yesterday and he's like, I haven't changed it yet. And I'm like, well, we've been at this for about two weeks and this protector has been around for 45 years. So let's have some compassion for it taking a little bit of time to slow down. So slowing down, and 
if you're not that activated, because a lot of our inner narrators feel like problem solvers, right? So you, you don't necessarily have to be like full blown reaction mode. And so actually noting, noticing those is really helpful because they are the ones that make us, lead us to, lead us astray because they show up as if they're really helpful, right, sometimes. And so, um, and so checking that and checking the outcomes and you know, what the results is really gonna help us. And so what we need to do is instead of reacting, breathe. If it's not super activated, we can just breathe through it. Don't engage in the reaction. But if it were really activated, like my anxious helper is one that like, I get really anxious and I'm like, I, I just wanna say yes, I wanna take this, I wanna do this with the person. I slow down and I say, I know this activation is happening. I know I'm about to engage in my helper tendencies. I'm gonna tell this person I'm about to do that. I'm actually just gonna tell them. And then I'm gonna ask for some time. Then I'm gonna go back and I actually do contemplation, just a quiet, meditative contemplation I bring up the scenario, I bring up the inner narrator, and I say, let's have a chat. I see you. I hear your concerns. But if we do this, what would happen? And I'm actually in compassionate dialogue. And I remind my inner narrators, because they're at a certain age and sometimes they're not aware that we're like 45 years old, and not three, right? So I'm like, as a 45 year old, I have these resources. You know, here are the support that we can get. Here are ways that we can approach this. Um, so we engage in create, creative brainstorming and strategies. So when people will say, I have this behavior pattern, I want to change it, this is how you do it. Lastly, if a relational breakdowns happen, we have to re-engage with the person, right? And sometimes that is activating all by itself. How do I re-engage? So one simple way we can do that is just go back and re-engage with the person and say, I got activated, but my real intention is to be engaged in this project in a way that can move us forward. That's really what I want. What I did yesterday doesn't get us that. So I want to reset. So Tom, instead of all those assumptions he was making about his colleague, he can check those assumptions. He can say, can you tell me more about your perspective? Why don't you want this change? Tell me more. The magic work. And if we are calm and not activated, we can engage like, um, like the, the actors earlier, we can engage in a real dialogue, an authentic communication with the other person and really get to the crux of the problem and move the conversation forward. And in the midst of doing that, we can also, by genuinely showing curiosity about their experience, we can express a sense of safety without saying, I want to create safety. They just know it because you care. You want them to be heard and seen. Real quick, all of you have some printouts on your desks and you can take that with you because these are tendencies that we have when our inner narrators are activated. We do things like we make assumptions about other people. We might try to change their minds. We might be really engaged in convincing, solutioning, right? None of that creates safety. However, if you do the do column, you do steps one and two, and then you come back and re-engage, and you do these ways of listening and asking questions, what happens is that they feel safe. And the data that you need to get that project moving forward, the data that you need to feel a sense of connection to your daughter, the data that you need to create the relationships that you wanna create is going to be available to you. And you're gonna develop better adult strategies to create the results that you want in your life. So we're gonna do a contemplation exercise and we're just gonna have a moment to journal. I want you to think of a recent relational dynamic, a relational breakdown. Maybe something you wanna redo, a recent relational conflict with somebody at work, in your life. Use that conflict. You could close your eyes and replay it in your head like a movie. Relive it. 
And I want you to just notice what thoughts or voices are coming up for you. What thoughts or voices, okay? And then use these prompts to kind of get to know that voice. We're gonna do this and then we're gonna wrap up. You can draw this, draw the inner narrator if you want, if it, it's available to you, or you can just write down the questions and respond to it, okay? And just a quick reminder, if you're looking at a question and nothing's coming up, a really helpful technique is just close your eyes, ask that voice the question, and let what emerges emerge. Just sit quietly with it. All right, go ahead and come back to us. And again, if you need uh, these templates and things, just uh, drop me an email. I'll, I'll put my email address up in a little bit. And we don't have time to do this exercise, but once we slow down, you have this printout on your table. One really helpful thing is just say, how do I automatically react? Just circle one, really simple. Oh, I make assumptions about them. Oh, I try to fix the problem by jumping to solutions. That's my automatic reaction. Well, what do I want to do instead? So on this do column, circle one, right? And then you go into practice. Practice it and be really compassionate with yourself when you don't do it right. <laughs> okay, those are available for you. Any questions, reflections, one or two? Okay, I'm gonna wrap up and uh, I'd like to end with this. Pema Chodron says, if we want to make peace with ourselves and with the world at large, we have to look closely at the sources of our wars. I want you to remember that war and peace starts within us. And we're all just stumbling and wobbling and trying to get our way back to love and connection. So I want you to remember that we all deserve a little compassion and benevolence for ourselves and each other. Thank you.